make a separate video for this one. All right, so I'm going to start by just showing you, and I have, um, so I should mention, um, formal mapping, there is, uh, remind me to send you the, um, uh, I have a handout. From, um, I'll try to. I'll, I have a handout from a book by. Um, so your differential equations text. Mm -hmm. uh, two of the authors on that. Um, Sapp and Snyder. Sapp and Sapp and Snyder's complex analysis. I think is one of the, it may be the best. In my view, it's the best, especially for like engineers. Um, not that you're an engineer, obviously, but it's, it is a really good starting book in complex analysis because it really explains how to do the calculations nicely. And um, it's not a low level book either. It's not like a it's not like a, this is complex variables for dummies. Like it's written for an intelligence audience. And um, there's just like a lot of good intuition on why theorems are true. And, um, you know, I think one of the authors is a mathematician, but the other is like an electrical engineer. Mm. So there's a pragmatism to the book, which is nice. I just, I, I, of all the, I mean, I think it's, it's probably my choice for a, um, if I'm teaching complex analysis to a mixed audience of engineers and math, math majors like this, that's the book. All right, so that said, I've got a handout to give you there. Um, but essentially, let's just try to set the stage here. So we've got the z-plane, and we've got the w-plane, right? So um, this is going to be complex for a bit. So, of course, you have like Z here, and you've got W over there, right? And you can suppose you've got some sort of mapping, F, all right? And that'd be a complex differentiable map, all right? Um, and then, <laughs> and then you can suppose that you've got some kind of um, trying to use his notation here. Phi. Is a function defined on D, then D prime inherits V through the one to one mapping. Size. So we might have. Some region D here, and you might have. Um, he says you could have phi um, defined there on that region, and then <clears throat> over here, maybe you have D um, D prime. Well, I'll just say you have f of D. The image of D under F. And um, if you have phi here, you can construct 
a function psi over there. So what we usually say. Mm -hmm. We usually go, well, not really, but we usually go down. Yeah, well, hmm. uh, let's see here. So psi. Define over there on F of now. How are we going to define psi? So psi of w, I guess, would be, um, I want to define it in terms of phi, right? So it's going to be phi of what? Phi of f inverse of w. find over there and build a psi over here, right? Or let's turn the tables, right? You could have a psi defined over here and, and pull it back, right? To the domain, how would that go? So if I had, suppose I had, I had phi here, right? Excuse me, I had psi over here. I want to go back over to here. So how would I define phi of z in terms of, in terms of psi? If psi, if psi is defined on the image of f under d, how would I define psi? Psi of z would be what? It would be, I mean, phi of z would be psi of what? P of Z would be. Ooh, uh, okay, wait, wait. Um, it's equal to psi. So it'd be um, psi of Z would be. Ooh, yeah, she F, so psi of Z. And then you go to you phi, phi of z. Yeah, phi of z would equal. You go to that map, and then you come back. So z goes up right here. Here, w equals to f of z, right? Yeah, and so it'd be f inverse of no. No, there's just you just f of z. F of z. Yeah. yeah. So it's a little bit, it's like it's a little bit counterintuitive, but yeah. if you want to avoid, if you want to avoid talking about the inverse function, you should think about. I have a function. I have a. Um, I have a function right here. Right. Then I can get a function back here, by this composition. In other words, I'm pulling back. The function psi to the function phi. Okay, so my question is, um, phi of z, okay, it goes to z in the z plane, right? And then f transports z stuff to w stuff. But mm -hmm. psi, um, why is psi taking a w input? Well, because I'm saying psi, I'm saying, suppose psi is given over here. Oh. Uh, I'm only drawing the domain of phi and psi. I'm not actually going to draw more than map to. They're both complex valued in general. Okay. Well, they could be real valued actually. Um, okay. Because no, I haven't really spoken to the values of psi or phi. I'm just saying you can you can manipulate the domain of these functions to create functions that have different domains by either composing with if this has an invertible map. In fact, we are assuming it's an invertible map. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just it threw me off because you're inputting something from w into psi. Mm -hmm. To get. Oh, yeah, hold up. Okay, so. Okay, 
there. So you get a fee of Z, which gives you, which goes to F of Z, which F of Z has to come from a psi of a psi of F of Z. See what I'm saying? Like I'm not saying. I, I might just be getting confused by the. I mean, here's the. Here, here's the. Uh, the side of W mapped to W, like a point W. Here's the game plan. Mm -hmm. The game plan? No. Plan. Um, one. We're given. Or construct. Um, psi. Which is a function from. You know, some perhaps some subset of. Well, anyway, from f of d, let's say. To whatever, either I haven't really said it, but whatever it is, it could be C, it could be R. And two, construct phi um, equal to psi composed of that. So that goes D to F of D back to C. So, uh, from my understanding, you take phi of z, mm -hmm. and it goes and it maps this something. Phi of, so you can give it psi of w. Psi of w. No, 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 not. Well, I'm talking about what what you wrote here. Like, you were you were given a point z of, of phi, right? On here. This. this oh, sorry. sorry. Fine. So. V goes to here, f of z, but this is going that way. So like I'm saying. No, oh, no, no, no. This is not. I'm not trying. To, this is not a picture of how v is acting. Oh, no, I'm just. This is. I'm sorry. My bad. This, uh, this arrow just indicates the domain of psi is here. Oh. The domain of phi is here. Oh, That's all okay. I'm trying to say. I'm oh. Like, sorry. Uh, you're, you're. You're not. Uh, my apologies. Like uh, this. This picture is at odds with my other pictures. You know. Like I should just say. <sighs> Sorry, right. you're fine. fine. So, um, try to come up with an example, right? Let's try to come up with an example. Like, um, ah, so, um, Now, I, I guess I should say, if psi is um, if psi is complex differentiable, then you know the chain rule applies here, and like phi prime is psi prime of f. I guess I should mention that. Well, maybe I should maybe I should focus on the example. We focus on the example. Come up with a good example. You cheat. Oh, <laughs> uh, I'm with you now. I'm with you. Okay. All right. This, that's kind of funky, though. All right. So. Hmm. Ooh, wait, 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 wait. Okay. So. V of f inverse of w is equal to psi of w, right? V of... Right, you're right under what you had. Oh, yeah. Under your short, right? Right, yeah. So, if that's the inverse... Yeah, I'm not, I'm not actually going to use that. My, I, I was, that was just a... Oh, okay, because I was about to say, the, your psi of f of z, f, wouldn't it have to map over to v of f inverse of z? Keep it consistent. 
Well, if you put w equal to f of z, right, then you get phi of f inverse of f of z. f inverse of f of z is phi of z. So like there. Okay. Yep. Okay. So. All right. Let's we try to we try to come up with a really concrete example. All right. So relatively simple example, but. Um, We could take, like, D is the um, upper half plane. So, like, D is imaginary part of Z greater than zero, uh, greater than equal to zero. So, that's my D, right? And my function could be the squaring function, right? So, I map, I map Z maps to w equal to z squared, right? So w equal to z squared, what that's going to do actually is give you everything. <laughs> so f of d, tell you what, let me Let me throw out, like, well, I'm, I'm worried, I, I don't think it's quite one-to-one -one if I do that, because, so let, me, let me just, uh, the curses, I'm sorry, I'm trying to think. Uh, let me make it simpler, let's, let's just do, let's do the, like, quarter. Let me just do like up here. Um, so this this is my b, you know, and I square it. And what happens when you square the first quadrant? You get stuff in the first quadrant. Yeah. So if I have if I have z equals to, you know, modulus of z e to the i theta for 0 less than or equal to theta uh, less than or equal to pi over 4, and I square it, I get modulus of z squared e to the 2i theta, right? And so here beta equals to 2 theta ranges from what? First quadrant goes to pi over 2. Yeah. Duh. So when we square it, we end up with like 2 pi over 2, which is pi. You know? So you take the first quadrant, you square it under the complex square map, and you get the whole upper half one, right? The real axis included since I included it in zero. So here's my z. Here's my w. So that's the F. Yep. Now the question is, what's an interesting choice of psi? Like what function can we find that's defined on you know, part of the upper half plane that we want to pull back and see what it looks like? We got lots of choices. Um, here, I'll make one up. Um, Psi of W equal to, gee, I don't know, um, the imaginary part of W. How about that? You know, Psi of U plus IV equal to V is what I'm saying. For example. 
So then the corresponding function that we pull back to is what? V of z is psi of z squared in this case, right? But z squared is what? It's x squared minus y squared plus 2ixy. So this right here is actually equal to 2xy. Because that's the, the the v component. Oh yes. So v here is two x y. So okay. So what? Here's the thing. If we are to calculate the, well, just humor me and suppose that we're dealing with complex for complex value things for a second, um, then I can calculate phi prime. Well, phi prime of z is what? It's psi prime, right, of f of z times well, the FDZ, right, by the chain rule? Yeah. But sort of the larger point here is just that if F is complex differentiable and Psi is complex differentiable, then Phi is complex differentiable. And what does that mean about Phi? That means that if we write, if we write Phi as Phi1 plus I Phi2, right, then these two are what? Separately solving what? They solve partial squared, partial x squared, plus partial squared, partial y squared, um, phi i equal to zero. They solve the Floss's equation. Now it turns out, if your function is not complex valued, um, but it is the, I'm trying to remember here, I, I, I want to say it even works for, if, if the psi is a solution to Laplace's equation, I'm pretty sure this is a theorem I can prove. We're a little short on time, so I'm, I'm reluctant to try to prove it, right? It's tough. I, I'm reluctant to try to, to do it because I think I need to, about a half hour to like properly mm -hmm. put everything together. But anyway, the theorem is essentially this. Um, psi solves Laplace equation implies phi solves Laplace. Equation. This is Laplace's equation. Now, and in, in, in that, that's a little bit glib, but I'm not saying that they're solving Laplace's equation in the same spot. Psi solves Laplace's equation as it's written in the W plane. Ooh. Phi solves Laplace's equation in the Z plane. So, in other words, in the notation, you might have like psi u u plus psi v v equal to zero. When you track back over here, you get phi x x plus phi y y equal to zero. Does this solve Laplace's equation? It's kind of stupid. Um, so, 
we take so it's, so it's psi. So in, over here in the dub, so we have to check is psi u u plus psi v v equal to zero. Uh, that's easy. Just differentiate twice with u and differentiate. Yeah, yeah zero. zero. Right. This is utterly stupidly clearly a solution to Laplace's equation. Yeah. In the w plane, is this a solution to Laplace's equation in the z plane? In other words, is v x x plus v y y equal to zero? Um, so you get rid of 1x and you get 0, then you get rid of y and you get 0. Yes. Right. But it's not quite as stupid anymore, is it? So this, if you wanted, so like over here, the original one, if you wanted, if you wanted your function to be um, like equal to 1, suppose you're looking for a solution to Laplace's equation, right, which has psi equal to 1 here, right, and psi equal to 2 here, where this is v equals to 1 and v equals to 2. It's kind of dumb, but this right here solves Laplace's equation on this strip subject to these boundary conditions, 1 here, 2 there. Right? This also solves Laplace's equation in the z-plane. But not the same way. But not the same way. What do these boundary conditions look like? What do they get transported back to? In other words, what's, what is this, if we have v equals to 1, where did that come from? from well, we know that if for See, there, that's... This side is, 1 would be would be phi of z, right? Yeah, I, see, there, that's, where I, that's where I need the inverse map to really understand what this, the, you know, v, the v equals to 1 mm -hmm. line here. So uh, what I'm looking for is, what's the solution set of x squared, what, what's the solution set of z, z squared equals to 1? Like, where did that... What is the solution set to that? Seems like a point, right? <laughs> well, it's, yeah, it's modulus of z squared e to the 2i theta equal to 1. So that is going to require that theta is, zero. is either 0 or pi, or, or, or 2 pi. 2 pi. So, well, so theta is, I mean, we have to solve, so we're, what we're trying to do is we're trying to solve at the moment e to the 2i theta equal to 1 subject to this choice of theta. Oh, yeah, yeah. So what are the solutions? 1 and, ooh, there's no, there's no 2 pi. There's no 2 pi. We just get 0, right? Yeah. So I should have used some better color coding here. V right. equals to 1. I guess it's just this, right? Because apparently it's theta equal to 0, right? But, yeah, if I haven't made a mistake, which I might have. How about V equal to 2? Um, so you put uh, V equal to 2. I'm trying to solve. Would make Z, 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 oh, so can I solve Z squared equals to 2? For that, for that two. You Oh, I'm an idiot. I'm an idiot. Huh? I'm an idiot. Is that equal to, is psi equal to 1 there? Excuse me. Oh, no, no, oh, man. Never mind. Sorry, but. So z squared two. But, but the then, but, 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 um, but I'm sorry, that's not, a, that's not a fair characterization of what this line is, right? This calculation's off. I'm sorry. Let me back, 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 back. This is garbage, 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 garbage. My, my apologies. Garbage, 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 garbage. Still garbage. Garbage, 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 garbage. Because it's this, this is not described by one, right? What is that? <laughs> it's a it's a line, so it'd be like a. 
what? W equal to what? It's W equals to one. Um, like anything. Anything. T yeah. plus I. That's that's that one. Because it's it's that's what that is. So the question is. that equal to z squared, like what z squared solves that? Um, so the good news is here that the inverse function is something we actually have a formula for. Inverse, f inverse of w is the square root of w. All right, and the square root of w is literally the square root of the modulus of w, e to the i uh, r of w over 2. So um, w equal to t plus i. What's the length of that? The length of that is the square root of t squared plus 1. That's the length of this complex number. And fortunately, I'm going to... square root plus one? Yeah. Because the t plus i... Oh, you're taking the a and b part. The, the length of it. Yeah. The modulus. Sorry. And then you're fine. And then the angle. Well, the angle's a little bit fussy, but... Um, let me just start out with this piece of it. Then there... It's just inverse tangent. I mean, it's it, you could write it as. Um, could we take the polar form of it? Yeah, that's my point. Is the polar angle we can just calculate by i from inverse tangent of um, one over t. Yeah. Yeah. So. What is uh, as t varies? Um, I mean, oh, excuse me. So now I have to take the square root of that. <laughs> you know, excuse me. I have to take um, so that's what a typical point looks like here. And if I want to see what it goes back to under the square function, I guess I, have, I, I should look at z equal to f inverse of w, right? Which is this, right? So it's like this, the fourth root of t squared plus 1, right? And then exponential of i over 2, inverse tangent of i over t. Then you can ask yourself the question, OK, so what happens as, as t goes to infinity, what happens to this, you know? What's the inverse tangent of 0? Well, it's 0. Um, what happens as as t goes to like um, um, zero from the right? You know, as you're approaching here. Um, from this equation, it just goes it, that that x just becomes one. Well, we get we get inverse tangent essentially of infinity in that way, right? Um, is that right? No, because it's going towards zero. <laughs> Well, one, one over t is going to zero from the right. Yeah. As t goes to zero from the right, you know? Yeah. So that means we're looking at an inverse tangent of infinity. Inverse tangent of infinity, in a limiting sense, is pi over 2. Mm -hmm. So this becomes... Pi over, I pi over 4. Pi over 4, right. So, um, and, okay, so, tracking back a second here. Uh, t 
goes to infinity, this goes to zero. Um, so we're on the, the straight up the real axis, we're really far out. So like we're starting, like we're starting, I, I don't want to draw this, I don't mean to draw that line to say that that's where it goes. I'm just trying to say that like if you want to think about it, it's somewhere like out here somewhere, right? It's, it's close to angle zero and it's, it's far out yeah. at t and infinity. When t gets to z, approaches zero, you're at one, length one from the origin, and you're at angle pi over four. One from the origin, pi over four. So you're like here. So it's doing something like this. I mean, that's out there. And then what happens if you go over here, you have to, you can't use inverse tangent anymore. You have to use a different, like, argument function. Think about it. But over here, let me just kind of throw it through it. Um, let's see here. The um, curses. This, we're starting at pi over 2 here. And we're going to angle pi as you go really, really far out. So um, we start out like here. And then, as you go to angle, what happens as you go to pi? Tan inverse of pi is the You get pi i over 2. What's, pi, what's exponential of? That's negative 1. Yeah, pi, let's see here, is that right? Inverse tangent of, um, sorry, I'm thinking. This, this, this. This, this should be pi, it should track back to pi over 2 over here. So like my point is, like I, I think if we sort through it all, we should, I mean if I was more careful, we should get something like this. And actually it's, it's like, it's like, these are asymptotically to yeah. the... Okay. And that's just from the 1. Now from the 2, I think what we find, Actually, if we sort through things, is that that is coming from, like this is square root 2 out. See, like the uh, square root of 2 at i pi over 4? Mm -hmm. This point right here, just for example. Sometimes it's easier to work backwards and guess. So this point, like square root of 2, e to the i pi over 4. You square that thing. And that gives you this point, 2 e to the i pi over 2, which is 2 is 2i. So this point maps to that point under the square. And then I believe what ends up happening is that this goes like that, and this goes like that. And the way these kind of maps work is they make respect orientations of boundaries and stuff. So what's interior to the two boundary curves to start with will be... Oh, that'll be interior of these two boundary curves? Exactly. Oh, like this cool. strip gets mapped to this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or the other way around. Yeah. Oh. So, okay, so, and, but the thing is, it's, it's more, it's stronger than just that, because phi is equal to 1 on that one. Mm-hmm. And phi is equal to 2 on that one. In fact, the equation of the yellow curve is exactly 2xy equal to 1. See, y equals to 2 over x is a hyperbola. Yeah. That's the yellow curve. Um, and then the, um, the blue one would be y equals, I mean, 2xy equals to 2, which would give you hyperbola, which was like a, a little more shallow and out. So the yellow one is like 2xy. Excuse me, y equals, no, excuse me, the other way around. This one has, so you, you I'm sorry, this is y is equal to, um, 
1 over 2x, whereas the other one is y is equal to 1 over x. The blue, the, I think that's 1 over x, and I think that's 2 over x, 1 over 2x. Um, remember, v here is 2xy. So if I, I can just set the 2 equal to 2xy and get those equations, all I'm saying. makes this method cool is coming to a deeper understanding of target shapes over here and given mappings f and knowing how that thing maps back to something over here. So to give you a, a, um, you know, a simple example, um, if you take like sectors, this is kind of what this example looks like. Is this is I, I took the sector, which is the uh, first quadrant, and I squared it to get the mm -hmm. upper half plane, right? But you could play this kind of game with like, you know, tighter sectors and like fanning them out. Um, the thing is, um, well, to fully appreciate this, we need to study more. Um, I mean, the study of conformal mapping and complex analysis, it's full of looking at how to take particular complex maps that, you know, go from one, from the z-plane to the w-plane in, in, in an interesting way. Um, oftentimes, we choose the w-plane to be like the upper half-plane, kind of like I did. Um, there's things called fractional linear transformations that are especially interesting. Um, so this is just a so um, similarly. Um, so I, I I suppose I'm not. I, I need to double check on this. It may be that you need phi or psi to either be the real or imaginary um, component to a complex differential function for this to work. Like I might not be able to do this with an arbitrary um, function that satisfies, actually that's a good question, is an arbitrary function which satisfies the Laplace's equation going to be the real or imaginary component of some complex differential function? Um, Maybe not. Um, but there are many examples of things like this. So like an, a, another good example that is really, really powerful in complex analysis is the, um, the logarithm. So if you look at the, the log of z, it ends up being the natural log of the modulus of z plus i times the argument of z. And um, so now that that's this is called the principal logarithm. Generally speaking, the log has infinitely many values because if you try to solve the equation e to the z equal to w, there's infinitely many z that solve it. So the log is not a single value. But if this is the principal logarithm, it's the principal argument, which means that basically it, it limits the choice of standard angle to a specific like minus pi to pi. Um, one of those is included, <laughs> and um, getting to the point here, so this right here is the real component of a complex differential function, and just as well, you could just as well look at something like psi of w equal to, you know, a times the natural log of the absolute value of w <laughs> plus a constant. See, you could use this as your so-called like template solution over here. This allows you to write a solution of Laplace's equation on an annulus. See, because it's easy enough to choose A and B, mm -hmm. so that if you're trying.
trying to solve something like, you know, you know if you want a, want a 5 here and a 10 there, and you know, you know the radii, you can select choices of make a disk. You can select, or yeah, you can you can make it. You can also do it on a disk, yeah. Um, well, the puncture disk, perhaps, uh, because this gets into trouble at the origin. So really, it's more for analy. But the the log of zero is not defined even in complex analysis. Zero's problem. Negative numbers, we can take the log of all day long in complex analysis. Not a big deal. Zero. Is that related to that? Maybe. Oh yeah, those those are not disconnected questions altogether. But um, this, so if you can choose A and B to make that happen, if I actually told you the radii, that would give you a solution to this this, this disk on the W plane. And then you can start asking yourself the question, huh? So what is the pre-image of an annulus under different mappings? I mean, there's a really simple one. Just translation, yeah, right. F could just be plus a constant, like you know, f of z equals to z minus z naught, right? Yeah. In that case, this is going to move this to an annulus based at z naught instead of z instead of the origin. And um, it can be, you know, it can be applied to simple things like that. Um, you, could, you could blow the annulus up, right? You could have like f of z is, you know, two z or something stupid like that. And, um, and under that, this is going to go to something that's like smaller. Because if, if, if this is the image of the 2z map, then to go back, you have to divide by 2. So it's going to be like an annulus, which is shrunk by half in terms of radii. Okay. What's, what's much cooler, though, is the fractional fractional linear transformations, the so-called Mobius transformations. Um, they allow you to, <clears throat> basically, here's the deal. If you pick three points in the z-plane, and you pick three points in the w-plane, all right. There is a fractional linear transformation that will take that triple to that triple and maintain the ordering of the points. And these fractional linear transformations take generalized circles to generalized circles. So you could have a point set which is a circle and always have a mapping to another point set that's also a circle? Yes, but keep in mind that a circle might be a line. So what's interior to the original circle yeah. might be above the real axis. Oh. Ooh. So you can do something like map a circle here to that line there. Whereas this was inside, now this is what's inside. Oh. And to properly do this, you have to like extend. The, the calculational apparatus for this is best understood by adjoining infinity yeah. uh, to the complex numbers. Oh, that, that breaks my head a little bit. How it, but it's... Uh, how inside and one mapping is like... In, well, inside, let's say, if, if we go... It's kind of in quotations. Yeah, I should say in quotes, because if, if it's one, then two, then three, my usual inclination is I imagine myself as a little dude walking along it, you know? Yeah. And so inside actually would be outside here. Yeah. Oops. You know? Yeah. Because if I walk around, this is actually clockwise oriented, so the outside is actually, inside is actually outside here, well, in that sense. And then if I, if it's, if I imagine here, Okay, yeah, inside was to the left, so it's up here. It even keeps that orientation? Yes, Ooh. yes, because when you look at the um, Jacobian of f, it is, the, it ends up being equal to the modulus of f prime, 
which is necessarily positive. So it, it's the, the preserve orientation. Mm -hmm. And that means that the inside maps to the inside. Now, the, the, this is just like using the, the log, the circles, the yeah. fractional linear transformations, great. You know, you got your shifts, your square functions. This is basic stuff. Okay. Past this, there's much more interesting things that will do things like map. Um, there are ways to like map the half plane to something that's like this. You can you can pick all manner of like funky shapes defined by corner points. And there are there are techniques for coming up with mappings mm -hmm. that map the half plane to that. So uh, my next question is is are we trying to find something like interesting in particular? Or, or is this if you can map the half plane to that, that means that you can take the Laplace's equation, the Laplace solution back in the half plane. Yeah. And you can map it over to this, which means you've solved Laplace's equation subject to a boundary condition, which is quite horrible. See, because the other thing I haven't told you is in the half plane, you can you can make it, you can you can add like little singular points along this, along the edge, and you can make it like, I want the Laplace's equation to be two from here to here three from here to here, seven from here to here. Yeah. And you can do that at finally many regions. There's like standard formulas for doing this. You can take those and then like through these, pick the right choice of function, the pre-image of that half plane can be something really funky like this. However, the details of finding the map that, that does this ends up, the, uh, the, the cost to you is certain horrible integrals which are actually not possibly calculable by hand. But nevertheless, that reduces it to the problem of numerically finding certain rather horrible integrals to actually find the solution here. Something like this is the idea. Um, I'm not an expert in those things, but there is, there's like a next level to this conformal mapping idea. People have done very hard calculations. There's much, much that's known. Whole books have been written about conformal mapping. Um, I like solutions over wing foot, like the airplane wing. There's there's something for that, for example. There's no like that's that's exactly all kinds of stuff. Like if you like can this. do that. Wait, wait, I gotta go. So just yeah. wanted to oh. wanted to get you started. Now of course if we can do it for the complexes, well could we, could we do it for yeah. other spaces?